Now, uh, Pastor Matt, you can come and bring the word to us. Thanks. Good morning to everyone. It's a privilege to be here. And actually, uh, Pastor Bill gave me a call just this Monday and asked to see if I would be available to come and speak to and share the word to this church. And uh, I actually grabbed the opportunity immediately, uh, not only for the fact that it's been a while since I preached in the morning church. <laughs> uh, that was way back in the Philippines. And uh, as you probably have noticed, a lot of Filipinos here are uh, working mostly in uh, related to the medical field and so a lot of them working night shift and i guess that's the reason why uh international baptist church had their bible study or their church done in the afternoon because a lot of them would like to sleep in in the morning <laughs> and then go to church in uh, the afternoon but also of course it's a privilege for me to be able to come here and uh, also i'm here representing the church just to wanting to thank you also and express our gratitude for your continuous prayer and support and especially your partnership as we labor together in the uh, for the gospel for the lord jesus christ and uh, uh, i'm personally very grateful especially for this church for allowing us to uh, use the facilities and i'm grateful also for the bennett family especially to lydia and uh, uh, jonathan uh, i don't know how they do it they come here in the morning they come to the church in the afternoon and also in the evening service <laughs> It was formerly Matt who used to be here. I was back here in 2013, was able to attend the service as well. So I'm very, very grateful for all that you do and for all your prayers and support for us. Now, uh, just maybe this is probably going to be something I would do just once. <laughs> and uh, just a little bit of introduction about myself. I actually came from the Philippines, although I spent uh, half of my life in Thailand. That's because my parents were both missionaries there for 20 years. So you could say that I'm more Thai than a Filipino. And uh, we migrated here in 2013, and uh, I spent only for about four months in California, and I moved here first to uh, Pennsylvania to pursue my graduate studies in Clark Summit Baptist Bible Seminary. And then eventually I went to New York, moved there around 2016, and uh, began to, uh, it's, I, I, was, I was given a role to be an interim pastor of a church, and that's where I also met my wife, Rika, and too sad she couldn't be here with us, and that's because, uh, you know, uh, last night the baby <laughs> uh, stayed up all night, and so she has to, you know, uh, attend the baby this morning. But we look forward to attending more of the services in the succeeding weeks. And, of course, in the 2017, uh, that was the moment that uh, I resigned from the church in New York, and that's when the church here in International Baptist Church extended uh, the, the, the role to, you know, if I could come and be the interim pastor. But then eventually it moved on to a more of a permanent role, and that is to become their full-time uh, pastor. At first I was a bit hesitant. It's because I still have a young baby, and then uh, we were still new in our marriage with my wife. And then so I kind of told the church, well, okay, we're going to pray about it. And we're, let's, let's see if, uh, and I kind of gave them actually a, an initial commitment of 18 months to see uh, where this would go. And we'll pray together how the Lord would guide us together as a church. We'll go together. And I'm really glad, glad how they, uh, the leaders, especially of the church, are responding and are very considerate with our situation as well. And upon answering that call to be their full-time pastor, I have three convictions that uh, I shared with them. And at number one, I want you to know that uh, Jesus Christ is coming back soon. That's number one. And because of that, number two, um, the harvest is truly plenteous and that the laborers are still few. And number three, Christ has given us the great commission to make disciples. And I personally do believe that in order for us to uh, be able to reap those harvests, the most effective way is to be involved in a global evangelization and discipleship. And that's why uh, it is my desire for the church. I'm there to not take away from the leadership from them, but to help them equip the, the leaders of the church and the people of the church to be ready for the ministry, which I am glad that many of them have really responded to take that uh, you know, responsibility to be part of the service for the Lord. And as a matter of fact, yesterday we just had uh, uh, two minute seminars, and that, that is one is for how to lead Bible studies, and one is for be involving in the children's ministry. And I'm glad that there were about 12 men who came, 
and about uh, 14 women that attended the, the children's ministry. And I'm just amazed how how the church is very hunger, hungry for, for the word of God and to be part of the kingdom of God. So continue to pray for the church. Uh, you really are, you, your prayers are really working and God is moving something in that church. And uh, I wouldn't claim that it's uh, what I do or what I've done, but it's really by the spirit alone that is moving in the hearts of people. And that's our prayer. Lord willing, by this coming November, we'll be able to have uh, three different uh, small group Bible studies in the north, and that is in around the Hartford area, and one here in Middletown or here in Hamden, and the other one would be in the south. And all of this will be led by this uh, enabled men or equipped men uh, to, to lead these Bible studies to impact the community around them. So continue to pray with us. We really would appreciate that. And uh, we are praying for you too. And especially, uh, you know, that you have a history, too, with the church. And it's our desire and prayer that uh, in any way we wanted to help the church in return as well. So how about let me pray for you and let's go now into the word of God. Heavenly Father, I wanted to just uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity for a time to come to worship you. Lord, it's uh, been uh, perhaps some of us here a tiring week for us from work there's a lot of cares and tr troubles and trials that is just weighing us down and uh, we're here lord um wanting to be still and to just uh sense your presence father and listen to your voice through the messages of the song that we sing the prayers of our brethren the scripture reading and even lord the uh the preaching of your word we wanted to once again have a gaze of your glory and to see lord the beauty of christ and we thank you lord because the reason why we're here is because we're redeemed we've been saved we've been delivered from our sins we've been purchased by your blood and we know lord that the reason why we're here is not because of our own but it's because of the righteousness of jesus christ and that's our confidence this morning and we're here lord um we renounce all the sins in our life and all the impurities in our hearts, any ill motives, any anger, bitterness, any unbelief, Father, we lay it down before you. And we just simply, Lord, want to come as we are, knowing, Lord, that we won't be cast away because of Christ. We can come boldly before your throne because of what Christ has done. And now we can go to you boldly with joy knowing that through Christ we are saved, we are delivered, and we can stand before you, and you will indeed receive us and listen to us and would accept the worship. And so, Father, I pray that this morning, I pray that you would use your word to once again refresh our hearts and our minds, and that you would make our hearts as well in tune with you, that uh, we may be renewed, Lord, in our relationship with you. I pray, too, that... As we would listen to your word, we would have new perspective in life about the trials that we face each day. And especially, Lord, that this would continue to transform our perspective of you so that our worship would deepen and our relationship with others, Lord, would also uh, be strengthened and be enriched, Father. And I pray for your people that you would give them, Lord, this morning a receiving heart, a heart that is teachable, a heart that would listen to you. And I pray, too, that you would prepare them to obey your word as you would instruct them, Lord. Help them that this morning, as they would listen to me, may it be that they would treat it as, they're, as though, Lord, they're listening uh, to you. And I'm just a messenger this morning, and I pray that you would enable this message, enable your messenger, that I would be able to speak boldly and with clarity in such a way that it would bless your people and would encourage them that we would all go home today transformed and renewed this i pray lord and ask by your grace and by your name i pray in jesus name amen now i'd like to share to you just one verse only today and uh, would you please open your bibles with me to jeremiah chapter 6 jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16 i typically would use the powerpoint but today i just simply choose to um, connect with you more and so uh, jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16 If you could uh, read with me there in verse 16, 
together, begin. Thus says the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way and walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Thank you. And uh, may God bless the reading of his word. Now, speaking of New York earlier, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting, and probably many of you know this by now, that it's usually called a Big Apple, right? And it's interesting, too, of its, how its reputation is known to be a city that never sleeps, <laughs> right? But um, just a few days ago, I read an article, and actually they, they would say and indicate that a lot of New Yorkers would even call it not just a city that never sleeps, but in fact, it's a city that never stops, it's a city that never stops, and uh, and she, she's not wrong. You see, New York City is 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 a city of uh, 8.5 million people who are paying some of the highest rents in the country, <laughs> and living in an outdated or old model house to some people, and in fact, they commute to work every day on a crowded subway, which, by the way, desperately needs an upgrade. If you've been to New York City, you can actually take a train here, Metro North, from New York, uh, from New Haven, all the way down to Grand Central. And uh, the reason why that is, you know, uh, because according to the article, it says that people come to New York to achieve a dream. People come to New York to achieve a dream. As a matter of fact, I know some people who commute every day from New Haven all the way to Grand Central to work there in Manhattan. And what's even crazy is that sometimes, I, I mean, there are even people, too, who come from Springfield, Massachusetts, to go to Grand Central all the way there. And probably these are people who are earning high income. That's probably the reason why they feel like it's a worth the travel. And so the article goes on and says, it's a tough city. People work very hard. Often people here have a second job in the evening. And it's causing a lot of stress despite having worked a ludicrous amount during the day. And it says, you don't live here to have a normal life. You don't live here to have a normal life in this city that never sleeps, in this city that never stops. But isn't this something that we all can resonate with? Just think about that for a second. Well, don't we all resonate with this characterization of New York City and the people of New York? You see, there are occasions in our life that we just simply do not stop. And we just, we just don't learn how to stop. You see, we live in a life of chronic busyness. We rush here, we rush there, we rush everywhere. That's why I, I, I typically would make a joke out of this. We might as well just call ourselves Russians, <laughs> not Americans, Russians. Why? Because we rush all the time. And so uh, as a consequence, our rushing life produces restlessness and shallowness. And when life is lived in constant rush, the product of who we become is a life of superficiality, disquietness, and discontentment of the soul. And listen, Christians, this morning, if we continue to go down this road without taking a step back and think about what's going on in our life, it can actually destroy us. It can actually ruin our soul. As, as a matter of fact, in the long run, it's going to affect the people around us, and especially those whom we love. Which has led me to a two conclusion, by the way, that in this world, there are only two categories of people. Number one, there are restless people. And number two, there are rested people. Sadly, in America, we have more restless people than rested people. It's, it's kind of funny, by the way, because several months ago, um, uh, my sister in San Francisco, she did her graduate studies and finished it in London. And so uh, towards the end of her studies, there was about three weeks left before her graduation. Since she was not doing anything, she took the opportunity to go to France and to spend about three weeks there in Paris. And, and so it's funny how on her third week, we actually talked and had a conversation. And she was telling me how she's starting to get tired of being on vacation and is restless to go back to California graduate and get a job. Isn't that <laughs> kind of ironic though? Now, I'm not sure if this, my observation is wrong. Now, I'm, I'm new here in America. I'm only here for six years. But, or, or maybe this is just a general observation of the American people today. And that is, uh, the observation is this. People love to work 
and go on vacation, but a lot of times they come back home more tired and they're, when, they were, uh, when, they, uh, when they were when they left. Okay? They're more tired when they were before they even left. Restless people. And isn't it true that while this country is, of course, we brag about it, that it's a nation of opportunity, and we brag about freedom, and yet the most unhappy and the most anxious and depressed people lived in this country, let alone the suicide rate of this country. <laughs> Where is restedness? Where is restedness? But would you believe me that this morning, if I told you that there's a place of restedness in the soul where you can find long-lasting joy and satisfaction. As a matter of fact, Christians, God has called us to restedness in Him, a place to anchor in the deep things in life. What really matters most in life, especially the deep things of God, to find stillness and quietness of the soul in the presence of God. But how? the question is, how do we do it? How do we do it? And we can actually find it here in this verse that we have just read, in just simple one verse here, we can find here three key consideration. As a matter of fact, I would consider this as a wisdom that comes from this ancient prophecies of Jeremiah to teach our restless soul how to find that rest. Number one, this first key consideration is this. Number one, beware of busyness without stillness. Beware of busyness without Stillness. What's that the word of God say in verse 16a? It says, there, Stand ye in the way and what? See. In other words, what he's saying there is to stop or cease and look. And I think this is one of the things, hardest things to do these days, and that is to stop and look, to stand by the way and See, now speaking, by the way, again, of New York, especially in Manhattan, it's kind of amazing. There was an article released, too, just a couple months ago. They said that one of the requirements for you to live in the city is that you must be able to walk really, really fast. <laughs> you know why? Because when you, when you slow down, it's either people are going to bump into you or they'll get mad at you for walking really slow because everybody is just in a fast pace. And I think this is a very perfect analogy of what real life is. It is full of rushing and going and running and so busy. It's hard to stop and look and to stand by the way and see. Now, just so you know, the context of this verse, it, it was actually addressed to the people of Judah. And, you know, just so you know, they have lost their way. And the judgment of God is coming to the Babylonians. It was falling upon them. And so Jeremiah here was addressing to this people who were at the crossroads of their lives. And now they're at the point whether they should repent, go back to God, following Him, obey His commandments, be faithful to them, or continue in their stubborn ways. And similarly, maybe we have these types of crossroads too in our lives as well. I mean, probably right now you're confronted with maybe tough choices in life. Dilemma, challenges in life, calling you to, to, to push yourself, catapult yourself to God who is our only health. It doesn't matter where you are in your phase in life, whether you're just in your prime years, or maybe you're in the latter years of your life. Crossroads are not respecters of persons. Challenges are always everywhere. And so the people of Israel here are in their crossroads. And so they have these decisions to make in their pilgrimage and in confounded sense of lostness, the words of Jeremiah came, and this is what he said. Stop <laughs> by the roads and what? Look. Stop by the roads and look. Are you in a crossroads today? Are you feeling any challenges lately? But you see, people, the challenge here is stop. We are so busy in doing, but there's no time for listening, digging, and thinking any longer. To ponder, to think about the profound things, in life have you done this lately have you been doing this lately when was the last time that you actually sat down and thought about hard uh, you know hard about life and God's leading for you and your family no wonder why one of the books that I read earlier said this one of the curses of this age is superficiality <laughs> superficiality our lives are very 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 shallow and it's often a product of a life that is not meditating, not 
thinking, always on a motion, but without direction. <laughs> yes, friends, to stop may seem counterintuitive for many reasons, I know, but believe me, there is wisdom in stopping, and it gives us the sense of quietness and sense of stillness in our soul. Now, I know that in management, probably when you were still working or in your job, not necessarily in formal class, we have a, some of you perhaps have to go through a lesson or have to learn how to manage, okay, with time, right? And uh, a lot of us have probably developed a skill of making your own, I would say, to-do list. Many of you probably put there in your refrigerator. There are to-do list in your life or priorities. Now, today I want to share to you a new perspective, a new paradigm. <laughs> and it's not just to-do list, but in order for you to have a good to-do list, my proposal to you is this. You must have a not-to-do list, <laughs> a stop-doing list. In other words, there are things that we have to stop doing temporarily, maybe some permanently, in order that we may be able to ponder on the major things in life. Think deep on the things that really matter. And in order for God's plan, His purposes, His principles of God to be operative in our lives, I'd like to call this the remove and replace. Okay? The remove and replace principle. Because if we fail to remove certain things in our lives that corrupt our very souls and our progress in God, we are missing what is vital to our journey with Him, the joy the peace and rest that we need for our soul. Something is missing in our business, isn't it? Is God speaking to you in this area? Have we been busy lately? That's why we have to be careful with busyness without stillness. Thus, we have to stop doing something in order to be able to do something, and especially what God wants us to do. So that's the first point here. That's the first point. That's the first principle here. That's the first key consideration. Beware of busyness without stillness. Number two. Number two. Beware of knowledge without wisdom. Beware of knowledge without wisdom. Now verse 16, he goes on and says there, Stand by the roads and look, or stand by the way and look, and ask for the old paths. Now there are two things I want to highlight here. Number one, we've got to learn how to ask. And number two, what we are to ask here, specifically, Jeremiah says, we are to ask for the old paths. Some translation would use the ancient paths. Now, often we lose our sense of direction, right? Whether you drive or you walk, not necessarily because we don't think we know the direction, but rather, oftentimes, we tend to assume that we already know. Okay? And because we assume that we know, we fail to ask. <laughs> That's a typical situation that we often encounter. And likewise in our relationship with God, in our Christian walk, we fail to ask Him because we assume that we know. Resulting to a lost sense of direction, we don't know what to do in the crossroads of life, and with this assumption, we fail to stop and look and ask of Him. That's why someone wiser told me this, and I would never forget this. He said, don't be shy to ask questions. It doesn't mean you're weak. It simply means you're wise. <laughs> and a wise person asks good questions. <laughs> okay? And the second highlight here is this. And this is the counsel in verse 16. God implies that we ask something very specific here. And Jeremiah says, ask for that old paths. Ask for that ancient paths. And what is this ancient path here? What is this ancient path? Now, in the context here, the word ancient path comes from the Hebrew word, which gives us a sense of time, okay? And it's not just a great measure of time, but in fact, an eternity time. And when we think of eternity, it's not just lots and lots of time. The notion of eternity here, rather, is a timelessness. It's in the sense of timelessness. And thus, I want to suggest to you in the text here that the ancient path here, or the old path, refers to timeless path. Okay? 
And what is this timeless path Jeremiah is referring to? And I want to suggest to you here that this timeless path is the revelation of God. It is the Bible. It is the Word of God. It is the timeless truth of God because the Word of God has already been there even before the beginning of time and it's always been throughout the history no matter how many people have tried to destroy it and it's always been there. Would you believe it that even philosophers believe in the wisdom of the ancient literatures? <laughs> in fact, they even tell you that if you really want to be wise, don't just you know, listen to someone wiser than you, that, but they would encourage you to even read literatures of the dead people. <laughs> Why? Because you're not only learning from the people who are living now with their wisdom from these experiences of this life, but when you read literatures written by dead people, <laughs> you actually are also encountering and learning from the experiences in their journals and all their lessons from their lifetime. Whether that the time before Christ or after Christ, the time of the reformers, the time of the enlightenment and all that, it's all full of wisdom. And the point is, if we can learn from these people and their wisdom, how much more with the word of God? That has always been there. And the truth and its principles are timeless and it's always relevant in whatever times that we live in. Now, I conducted a survey just a few years ago among the elderly and I kind of let them choose between, you know, I asked them, number one, would you rather have the strength from 40 years ago in order to live now or would you rather have your wisdom now and live 40 years back. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a surprise. The majority chose actually the wisdom that they have now living back then. You know why? Because of wisdom. And I'm sure many of us now have wishes also that if we could go back in time to correct this and have chosen a better path, we would have done it. Why? Because we learn from our mistakes. But you see, in life, this is what I realize, that it's not always, you know, wisdom is not always acquired by learning from mistakes. It can actually be learned from someone who is wiser and by taking heed of those words. Because wisdom, again, by definition, is the right application of the things we already know. That's why Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is what? Is the beginning of wisdom. The fear, the obedience to what the Lord has said that is the beginning of wisdom. That is why Jeremiah says here, stand by the way or stop and see. Do not be so busy that you become so lost and ask for the ancient path. Ask for the wisdom from the word of God because it is through the Bible that God reveals his timeless truth, his wisdom to us that we will be guided in our life. Now, there's a poster I saw once that goes this way. Beware of the barrenness of a busy life. Okay, Beware of a barrenness of a busy life because we can just go through, especially I realize too that where, where, where we're living now in the era or in the days where information now is available at the tip of your finger. And... Uh, the problem is that there's lack of this. It's not that we lack the information. I think we have so much information these days. I think what we lack is how to filter those, what is useful for our lives. And we can be very much actually tempted into just getting everything, to consume everything without filtering them. And many of them are actually harmful for our soul. So beware of knowledge without wisdom. Before I go to the third point, now notice here, Jeremiah did not just use the word path here in a singular form. He uses the word paths. Okay? And why paths? And that's because the plurality that we see here, the polarity of the different ways, it's being emphasized. And I want to suggest to you that, you know, it's because God knows the complexities of our life. Complexity is in the sense that there's not just one thing, on, uh, there's just there's a one, th one, one thing on top of the other, layers and layers of demands and responsibilities in life, problems here, problems there, 
work here and work there, bills here and bills there. It's everywhere. And that is why it is this reason that God tells us to stop and look and ask for the ancient paths. Because God has direction for us even in the complexities of life. Are we having troubles with marriage? The Bible addresses that. Are we having troubles in our family, in our friendship, in our work? The Bible addresses that. In our finances, the Bible addresses that as well. And God can lead us through in these complexities or our situations in life. So again, beware of knowledge without wisdom. And the last one here, and that is this. We not only find here the first two key considerations, that number one, beware of busyness without stillness. Number two, beware of knowledge without wisdom. And the last point would be this, that beware of thoughts without actions. Beware of thoughts without actions. Jeremiah says, stand by the way and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it and you shall find rest in your soul. Now notice there, the good way, that which is honorable, that which is praiseworthy, and you will find rest in your soul. Don't you find thinking people impressive? Sometimes I, I, you know, when I was back in graduate studies, I feel really intimidated because a lot of my friends, some of them already had their masters before and this, this, like that, but they, they intimidate me, especially when they, you know, present their papers, very articulate, very resourceful, very, you know, brilliant. But you see, yes, there are lots of people with deep thoughts and brilliant ideas, but sad to say, there are more thinking people than there are doing people these days. I mean, you probably can see that too in politics. People would just have a lot of opinions, but <laughs> less action, correct? <laughs> but let's not get there. Now, someone said this correctly, and he's really on point. He says, all good thoughts and ideas mean nothing without action. And I would go even as far as this by saying that vision without action is but a dream. <laughs> vision without action is but a dream. That's why this morning, if God has impressed something in your heart, act it out. Because what's impressive about Christian life is not so much how many amens do we get in Sunday mornings or how many times you've been convicted by God, but without putting that into an application and into action, there will be no changes in your life today. And friends, you know what? Um, I'm still young in the ministry, and this is one of the things that I learned. The truth itself does not change life, but truth applied is what changes lives. It's not just about, you know, appreciating the truth, but it's, it's the application of the truth that changes life. It is by walking in it. And the Bible gives us promise that we will find rest in our soul. So these are the three key considerations of Jeremiah. Number one, he says, hey, beware of busyness without stillness. Number two, beware of knowledge without wisdom. And number three, beware of thoughts without actions. Perhaps today you are restless. Perhaps today you are troubled. <laughs> Perhaps today you are in a crossroad where you need to make a decision. So. Personally, this is something that's really challenging me too. Sometimes I wish I could go back to the Philippines where everything is just, you know, uh, life is a little laid back. <laughs> People still get to talk. Uh, maybe this is just biased or for some reason, but since I came here to America, I noticed that, yes, wow, it's impressive. People have big houses. They have big walls and fences around them, but people don't talk. You don't see kids anymore playing outside. I mean, you can still see it once in a while. But there was a, probably a time, you still remember, that kids still get to go bike together, go play on the lake together. <laughs> but now everybody's just being individual. I don't know, maybe it's culture. And yet we see that people are not happy. They're chasing a dream that probably isn't there and isn't true, probably, I don't know. But again, 
What's happening? Because of restlessness. And so that's why here Jeremiah says, stop, see, and ask for a timeless wisdom. The principle of God's truth for the complicated paths of life where the good way is and walk in it and you will find peace and restedness in your soul. And ultimately, of course, these paths lead us to one who can truly give us rest, and that is Jesus Christ. I wonder why Jesus says, come to me, <laughs> all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So people, beware of busyness without stillness, knowledge without wisdom, and thoughts without action. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this brief reminder from your word. Um, it's, uh, I would say, a very fundamental message, and yet it's something that we can easily lose in this rushing culture that everybody seems to just move forward. There's so much activity. There's just so much busyness going on, yet we forget to and neglect, rather, the most important things in life, and that to begin with is our relationship with you. And often that reflects, too, in our negligence of our um, relationships around us, our loved ones, our marriage, our family. Lord, is just destroying us, and I pray that you would save your people from this. And I pray, Father, that along the business of life, these people would be able to find restedness in you father in your presence for your promise that in your presence there is fullness of joy in you alone our soul can be satisfied and we can find complete rest in your presence so father i pray that as you have blessed me with this message you would let these words um, stick in the hearts of your people and be a blessing to them as well and save us of course from you know um um, just simply a conviction without action this afternoon or this morning. And I pray that we would go out of this place ready to obey you, to change our lives with enablement of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.